Let the Steve Sarkeesian era begin in Los Angeles. Mark Rogers TV continuing our series looking at National Signing Day and the recruiting classes for some of the top programs across the country. Tonight we look at USC with uh, Evan Budrovich of Conquest Chronicles. It's a platform on the SB Nation uh, circuit uh, looking at USC athletics specifically. We're talking, of course, USC recruiting and that Trojan class uh, for 2014. Evan, thanks so much for joining us. Anytime. Appreciate it. Evan, all right. USC expected to do well on the field, and that starts with recruiting, and despite the scholarship productions, despite the coaching turmoil, a lot of pluses at USC, which we all know about, and therefore we expect a big recruiting class. Uh, run down some of the guys that really get you juiced up and the guys that we could really see star in Los Angeles very soon. Sure. Well, it, it all starts with the local guys. Uh, California has always been a great recruiting area for USC. You have to look at Adore Jackson, uh, the cornerback out of Sarah High School. Same high school as Marquise Lee, Robert Woods, George Farmer, you know, some star-studded guys from that same school. And, and he's another product. He's going to play some cornerback and wide receiver for SC, a very explosive athlete. He, he kind of reminds me of, of a nifty Devin Hester almost. He has some special team skills. I think he had like four punt return touchdowns in high school, so he's got some talent there. Uh, he's a big name, and then this guy, John Juju Smith, out of Long Beach Poly, another local kid, Poly, uh, Deshaun Jackson, uh, you know, all these big names who are now professionals coming from that high school, you know there's a good pedigree there. And then finally, the big lineman, and talk about a big kid, 370 pounds, all six foot four and a half of them, Damian Mama, uh, another big guy. Those are the three that ac actually all signed on national television just on Wednesday, and that really sparked the excitement because coming into that day, there were a lot of good kids in the recruiting class, but by no means were they the five-star kids. And when you get two five-stars and then a four-star in Mama, it really does flip your class into an elite level. And that's kind of why we saw the ranking finishing up around the 15 mark for USC. And that was a very promising end of the day because going into it, I don't want to say it was anyone's game, but people weren't exactly sure in the program. And even Sarkeesian mentioned that I didn't know if these guys were going to sign, which typically you don't see. But it's just the nature of having all those coaching changes, like you mentioned. It, it was hard to tell, but you know, luckily for USC, those three came, and that's a huge difference uh, for the recruiting class. Hey, Evan. Um, looking at the recruiting class, obviously a lot happens in that last 24 to 48 hours leading into signing day for USC. Who were those guys that uh, Sark possibly reeled in at the last hour, and maybe some of those guys that were lost that could have made this an even better class? Well, you know, unfortunately, the sanctions kind of played their part in this one. So uh, they had five guys enroll early uh, starting in the spring semester. So they only had 14 spots to give out. And obviously, that's a lot less than other schools. But when it comes down to it, it is a numbers game, and there's only so many spots you can offer. So I'll look at a couple of guys that could have made a difference. There was an offensive lineman out of Fresno State. He was only a two-star, but he was a rising prospect. Weren't able to give him the offer just because they, they had Damian Mama sign. And as a much more talented guy, you want him on the staff. Uh, a couple of good tight ends at the JC level locally that they couldn't sign. You know, the issue is it wasn't that USC missed on guys. They just didn't have the numbers for them. So really it comes down to that you can only offer who you have, so you have to make sure everyone is right. And that was kind of Lane Kiffin's uh, deal over the last two years. You couldn't make a mistake because you just couldn't afford it without the numbers. So I think it's not that it's a negative you couldn't get some of these guys because obviously I think Micah Quick is a name that comes to mind that he chose uh, Oklahoma over USC and UCLA. But you know, he was an explosive local product, and just, you just didn't have the numbers to get him, and then luckily able to get a couple of big guys later in the day. But I would say, overall, as a whole, 12 of the guys that you, you see of this roster, so 12 of the 19, they weren't even recruited by Sark right away. These were guys that he had to bring in himself and kind of work with off the fly. So it, it was really just this last month or so that he went out there and tried to bring these kids in. You know, everyone hears the names, but just to get in those relationships with the kids, and that's where Sark had to really work hard over the last month or so to really reel in these last 12 kids uh, coming into signing day. Evan, you get the beach out there, you got the surf and the sun. It shouldn't really be allowed that you have that much football talent. It sounds much like what I heard uh, talking to a Miami blogger a few nights ago and talking about Dade County and South Beach and, and the, the talent pool that they've got down there. There was a similar situation even without the sanctions at Miami where they had 26 scholarships and they actually had 47 four- and five-star recruits in a two-county region right there in South Florida, so they just can't take everyone. Sounds similar to the USC situation this year. Uh, Star comes in after the bowl game. Um, obviously, there's been much turmoil uh, in the latter portion of Lane Kiffin's tenure there at USC starting this season 
uh, with a couple losses there. He was ousted after the Arizona State loss. You bring in Ed Orgeron, who many were rooting for on that staff and in that locker room. He doesn't get the job. Sark does. Uh, the coaching influx, the, the turmoil that we saw, how did that play into to, to what happened uh, on signing day, do you believe? Well, I believe Ed Orgeron was beloved, and he did a great job of getting kids' attention. You know, him and T. Martin and Clay Helton were the three guys that kind of were a big part of the program once Kiffin left. And what they were able to do is just reach out to the kids because, it. I mean, as you know, it's all about those relationships and going to the high school. And actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, one week, USC had a bye. I believe it was right after the Arizona game, so it was right after he got fired. And, and Orgeron took a helicopter and went to five different high schools in the same night on just a you know a Friday night, checking out all these local kids. And he actually ended up offering uh, one of them. And it's just like it's kind of funny how you know obviously you got to find as many kids as you can. But Orgeron had to work so quickly as the head coach uh, for that little eight-week stretch that he was trying to go everywhere he can to to put his footing into the program. Now losing him was tough, and, and I feel like there's a kid Jalila Wadud would, would out of UCLA uh, who might have actually gone to USC if it wasn't for a couple of changes. Him and Sark weren't on the same page, but it wasn't like a, a negative per se. It was just he loved Orgeron so much. So there are those classic examples like that. But I think overall uh, the Orgeron change helped USC because just getting beating Stanford on the big Saturday night game and then being competitive in the Pac-12 down the stretch, it just legitimized USC once again as being, okay, we're a decent top 25 program that can then beat Fresno State in a bowl game. And that's always important because the last thing you want to do is end like two years ago going seven and six, and that was just an abysmal year. Uh, it didn't hurt recruiting per se, but it just hurt the reputation. And, and you know, for a lot of the kids, it's all about uh, how's that reputation. Like uh, Adore Jackson mentioned that one of the reasons why he came to SC was because of Reggie Bush. And and I joke around because I walk around the uh, the new – McKay Center and all these new athletic departments facilities, and they don't really have a lot of Reggie Bush mem or memorabilia or heritage in the building. But at the same time, his memory still lives on the Lendale White Reggie Bush era for USC, and those are kind of the reasons why kids who are growing up, who are now you know 17, 18 years old, were kind of watching those kids, and they were just young and realizing like that's why I want to go to SC. So there's definitely is that memory that sticks around from the glory days that can help kids recruit now. Evan, you named that team, so I'm going to go there, UCLA. Of course, they have not been much of a factor for the most of the last of uh, going back to the late 90s, Cade McCown, Bob Toledo, but now much, very much a factor with uh, Jim Mora on the scene. He's tightened things up there, certainly. There's no senior day in jumping the fence. There's uh, more of a professional-type mindset there at UCLA, and he's bringing in top talent, although I haven't really dissected that UCLA uh, recruiting class because I heard so much about some of the top players in the country coming to Westwood looking at the ranking it wasn't necessarily that impressive uh, has there been an impact on USC recruiting and the USC mindset with UCLA now forming somewhat of a challenge for the first time in many years yeah it's kinda like a double whammy actually you have the sanctions in place so you can only offer so many kids each year and then you have UCLA actually going after some of these four or five star kids it does create kind of a competition but I, I tend to believe that it it forces both schools to be more selective and, and make sure they got the right kids but at the same time I, I just looked down UCLA's board the last couple of days and they got some pretty decent kids I mean look at uh, linebacker Kenny Young out of New Orleans he was a guy USC was after early in the process but when it comes down to it Jim Moore is an excellent recruiter uh, he's a great head coach and I, I think he really outsmarted even Ed Orgeron in that game when they played uh, back in November. And, and that's kind of the thing. You know, Mora brings, he solidifies the program there, but he also says, you know what, we're going to try to get top 25 classes every year. And that's where USC has to also be like, well, obviously they have more prestige, more history of winning Rose Bowls and championships. So now it kind of comes down to for these new kids who weren't really raised in that generation, is it more about the history of USC or about the modern success that UCLA's had? And that could change, you know, year by year. But as of right now, I think UCLA has that, you know, we're beating USC back-to-back -back years, we're getting to Pac-12 championships, and we're playing uh, solid football every year while USC is kind of up and down. And hopefully for USC side that Sarkeesian can level the ship a little bit and bring that success back on a more uh, consistent level. 
the talent during uh, Pete Carroll's stay was obviously as good as we've ever seen maybe in college football in the last 20 or 30 years. At the same time, the Pac-12 is much better than it was at that point. It was a very top-heavy conference. You look at your division, don't even include Stanford and Oregon, and you've got an Arizona State team that has gotten much better. Uh, they had a top-20 recruiting class. You mentioned UCLA now uh, getting into the fight with Jim Mora as Coach, what are the expectations for this program? Is is Sark going to feel that pressure from the USC fan base to, to get off the deck immediately and and get to a Pac-12 championship game? Well, I think there's always pressure, you know, regardless of who's the head coach. But I think in Sarkeesian's case, which kind of helped him, he was under the Pete Carroll staff for a few years as an assistant. Actually, twice. He had two little tenures uh, under Pete, alongside Lane Kiffin, back when they were winning uh, Heisman's with Matt Leinart and championships at that level. So he understands what it takes to win under pressure. I, I, maybe he wasn't running the program, obviously, but he was running the offense. He was working with the quarterbacks. He knows how to instill the confidence in his players to succeed on the field when it matters most. So that's what he kind of brings to the table. I think in terms of the pressure, there's going to be pressure. Every year, you know, a 10-win season is considered a, a semi-failure, and we, we saw that even this year, 10-4, and four, where 14 games is a little bit above the average for USC, but still winning 10 games isn't enough. you got to win 11, 12, get to Pac-12 championships, and, and also be able to win those. So I think in this first year, the, the classic adage is, well, the coach gets a year to adjust. I'd actually argue Sarkeesian, he'll get that time, but he's not going to get the same amount of leeway as any other coach that's coming into a first-year program because Sarkeesian understands what USC means. He's gotten a great recruiting class now that we just saw, you know, top 15. So the pressure for USC is now to get to that Pac-12 championship and then compete with the UCLA's, the Stanford's, and the Oregon's of the world to not only get there, but then get to a Rose Bowl or get to that playoff system and, and try to make some waves there because if you don't do it in the first or second year, it all of a sudden becomes a, is this a false sense of hope around a Sarkeesian hire? And that's where he has to prove himself by winning. All right. Evan does some fine work for Conquest Chronicles. It is the SB Nation USC platform. And uh, again, excellent work there. And uh, certainly check out his work there. And uh, where else can we find you, Evan? Well, you can uh, actually find me on Twitter at Evan Bud. I, I do a lot of tweeting about USC. Um, in terms of work itself, usually that's my main focus for USC stuff. But uh, I just have to say, I mean, I appreciate it. And, you know, USC football, it used to be talk of the town. Now it's got some competition. But at the end of the day, there's always a good storyline with USC football because there's a big passionate fan base in L.A. when you're winning. And as long as you're doing well, people will be willing to listen and see what you have to say. Evan, we appreciate the insight and the information. We've got spring football coming up in a couple months and would love to have you back. I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime.